we introduced something new, you probably have already heard oh, about mojo, this, yeah. mojo. Uh, this is a very easy slide for me because there's a session coming after my session and uh, Stefan Wittmann, who is actually driving um, in large, uh, the, our Zen Mojo efforts is going to uh, tell you all about it. Um, it's a, like the, sex, the next wave of uh, how to do web application development, the next form of like Zen and CP, uh, CSP application development. It's not just for mobile development, I think. It's a, it's, I think it spans way beyond that. And uh, it's really going to be something that uh, a lot of people will find extremely attractive. And I'm glad that Stefan is going to, uh, to give you more um, details on this. Um, one of the things that we always talk a little bit at the beginning um, is about scalability of the system. Um, what are we going to, what are we doing in this area? And, um, and there are actually um, a lot of um, work going into the product, a lot of efforts going into the product um, to make the system um, more um, responsive and more aware of the existing technology. There's a lot of uh, hardware changes that have happened. Um, we're now running uh, systems that have a lot of cores uh, running that can produce uh, a lot of throughput in the environment. And, and if you look back, uh, like at the beginning of Cache and uh, when the first like eight core systems came out, we're talking about like 85,000 global access um, per second. Um, that is all has to grow and, um, and has to advance. So one of the things that, that we're seeing with these very large systems is that also the strategy um, on how to approach these kind of systems, how to actually scale, get more scalability out of these environments is changing. Um, so we did a lot of research on this, we're doing a lot of testing on this. And uh, I have a slide here that uh, talks a little bit about where we are today and what kind of results we're having. Um, it needs a little bit of explanation. Um, what we're doing is we're defining a load um, that uh, data that we have from a, from a hospital system, mostly SQL, select statements, insert updates, and uh, and one of them is what we define as a load. And then we put this on a on a multi-core system here. This is a 32-core system, and then uh, see how much throughput do we get as we increase the load on these running multiple of these uh, these environments. So at the beginning we started with four times the load and see what kind of throughput it is. And then you increase the load and see how far can you go. And the dark blue line here is for 2013.1. And as you reach 16 times this kind of load, if you go beyond this, what we saw is that we're actually losing that kind of scalability. We need to have a new way of approaching this because after this, with more cores, we're not scaling out very well anymore. So we started to put new changes into the uh, product, um, new algorithms uh, that react to these kind of environments. It's probably actually the more, probably more changes to the system we did in the last year than we did in the last five or six years uh, to the system. And so, so it's very fundamental changes we're putting in. And you see this here in the green, light green color. This is the new algorithms, the new approach, the same performance still for the smaller load capacity, so we're not losing anything in the smaller area, but we can scale out now to much higher throughputs. And uh, internal tests, um, we have put this column in there here for 28 times to use. Uh, you actually can see that you're approaching your 16 million uh, database reference per second. Um, that's quite an advancement from um, when we tested the first eight core systems, where we just had like 85. And that, and that was really the, the state of the art back then. Um, there's a lot of technology here. Of course, it's not just into systems changing to them. Processors are faster, cores are faster. There's a lot of hardware and uh, an operating system components here in, in it as well that make, this, uh, make that happen. So continued investment here um, that has a lot of benefit for you. You can get way more leverage out of existing hardware uh, by simply upgrading from a 2013.1 version uh, to the next version that has all these enhancements in it. Another area where we're um, pretty much doing a big effort of uh, improving performance is SQL. We have done a lot of changes in recent years um, to provide um, 
better ways to handle things that are getting larger um, or consume more, more resources. Um, we have made that available uh, to customers. Um, the initial one was, for example, having something like uh, Process Private Global. We had an array, a process was limited by space. Um, you could switch to a Process Private Global, um, which gave you pretty much unlimited amount of, of space. Um, and as needed, that data was written to a Cache 10 database and fetched again as, as it was needed. Um, then a few years ago, we removed the the performance overhead and the bottlenecks that we saw with scoring systems was local arrays made that much faster, um, way faster than it has ever been and we had even anticipated. And then we got it away with uh, local memory requirements. So you can take a process and make them really use very large amount of memories. So there's a lot of, of, of activity happening in this area and, um, and we haven't really taken advantage of this ourselves as well. So we're now changing the SQL system, changing the compiler, being aware of, of, of these kind of different and new ways of doing this and we're seeing um, significant performance improvements for SQL. Um, but everything um, will see performance improvements based also on what kind of queries you're running, what kind of complexity you're running. Um, but with some very complex um, SQL queries or medium complex SQL performance, uh, you see performance improvements for up to a factor of six. So six times faster than, than it was uh, before. And uh, there's a lot of parallelization happening. So everything that, uh, that we already provide is going into this uh, to make these kind of things work and faster. <laughs> We heard in uh, Robert's presentation, he talked about mirroring as a high availability uh, technology that uh, InterSystems provides. Um, we have made, or we're going to make with 2014.2, a very important um, improvement um, to mirroring. Um, you're all probably all familiar with mirroring where you have a primary system and a secondary system. The primary, the secondary work as a mirror set um, your clients connect to the mirror sets, not really knowing which machine, which of these two instances uh, this, the, the users are connecting to. The mirror set has made a decision that either one of them is a primary, the other one is the backup. Now for high availability, failover scenarios um, are, have to be handled. And there's always this problem of how do I reliably tell that the primary is actually down and unavailable? <coughs> is it only available? Um, because my network has problems, is it maybe still running? Um, what happens if I switch over to a backup and the primary was still running? Um, when we try to do some synchronization through the ISC agent, which is an outside process that runs on each machine, that helps us with um, a more reliable way of determination. But there's still a decision that has to happen somewhere, um, and there's a bunch of edge cases that uh, that are not really covered as cleanly as, uh, as we wanted it. So we're introducing um, what we call the mirror arbiter. Um, that's a third uh, instance running somewhere else. It's also based, uh, basically also using the ISC agent for this kind of communication. And it sits there and looks at both mirror sets and helps us now to determine um, what is the status of these, uh, of these two. So, um, ideal situation, you have my primary, I have my backup, the arbiter and all three are interconnected and sharing information about their state um, and any kind of transition that they have in the state. So if your primary goes away um, and, uh, and the other system becomes the backup, um, the arbiter can now uh, confirm um, uh, that, uh, that the connection to the, to the first one uh, is lost and can switch over and, uh, and make these kind of changes. So a lot of use cases, um, and uh, when when this is interesting, um, uh, for example, network isolations um, uh, and connectivity, I'm leaving them all here into the slides. I'm not going to talk to them all in detail, uh, but I know we're handing these slides out, so I thought it would be interesting um, if you're more interested in hearing about this, um, uh, to go through these uh, examples and, uh, and see them and prove for when this is useful. So, Kashid um, does not need to be installed um, on, uh, has to be on an external network, not of the same machine, of course. Um, you want to put it somewhere else. Um, can be, um, 
uh, has to be um, separated um, from the one the others. So you definitely want to make sure that they're not uh, disconnecting. Um, <coughs> that's a repetition of what I already said. Um, now, the most important thing is that this is um, a backward incompatible change that we have, that we're making. Um, so the, the old mechanism where there was a call that customers were using to figure out what is the state of the system, is other node down and upper Z mirror, that's going away and it's going to be replaced um, with this new mechanism. So if you use mirroring and then you go to 2014.2, there are some some operational administrative changes that you have to make uh, to make this transition. Um, the arbiter is a far superior uh, solution uh, going forward. Um, I put some links in here if you want to read some more details. Uh, we documented this change in the compatibility blog with a lot of details um, of what, it, uh, what this change entails um, and what it means. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Deep Sea um, in 2014.1. Um, the core changes or core enhancements that we have done in this area is the Cube Manager, uh, data-driven colors, uh, colors, custom drill down specs, and pivot variables. So we'll talk mm -hmm. about this uh, a little bit more in detail. Um, the Cube Manager um, is, a, is a powerful tool that helps you um, to take individual cubes or, or groups of cubes and define a build and synchronization schedule for them. So you don't have to do this manually anymore. The system oh, takes yeah, this, uh, care of this based on your definition here uh, by itself and then updates the cube data or synchronizes the uh, data with the other source. Data-driven colors um, is an enhancement request we got a lot. If you have colors by today, or in the previous version, um, prior to 2014.1, if you created them, we picked colors based on the series where this picked up. So there was one for the first one, there was a color for the second one, third or fourth. Um, if you would have that in the colors already, and you maybe applied filters that would change the series of the data you represented, then the color of that um, element would also change, because it would be now in a different position in the series. Um, that is something that uh, customers didn't like, also because it was inconsistent between multiple screens. Here the color was green, on the next screen it was maybe red or blue. So what this one does, it gives you now the possibility based on values uh, to specify which color do I want to pick. So if you have a region, for example, you can say, well, if it's Asia, pick blue as a color. If it's uh, South America, pick yellow as a color. And then it stays in this color even if you apply filters um, and change this around. Uh, custom drill down spec um, is a great enhancement that gives you um, more flexibility as you uh, drill down um, into the data that you have. Um, normally today if you um, click on a value uh, the system would go down one level deeper in, in the hierarchy and display the next values there. Here with, uh, with the custom drill down spec, you can actually specify uh, what it means when I click a double, when I do a double click on this, and where do I go? So you can either jump further down into the hierarchy, you can even display values that are even not part of that hierarchy. So you just define exactly how you want to uh, traverse through this environment. Um, uh, going forward, a uh, very powerful uh, way um, that uh, that you can define this and, uh, and use this in your in your environment. So what's new? The analyzer, uh, custom drill down spec. We just talked about this. Uh, pivot variables. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit at the end um, in more detail. Um, we have uh, measures. Um, the measure option. Um, um, the, the default today is um, this is uh, displayed based on a column. Now you can uh, change this and can uh, display this based on the row value. Um, we give you uh, now the possibility to disable and enable filters. So if you have a filter um, defined um, and you wanted to not have that filter in the past, you had to delete the filter. Now uh, you can just go there and disable it or enable it again. Um, it, we allow you now to overwrite I mean, well, the, for the total values, but there were mess, def, several main ways of calculating the total different strategies that you could pick. One of them is now none. 
um, basically don't calculate a total um, because maybe you're not interested in having one. One important feature that customers were asking for is like tool tips. Um, you hover over a value and you want to get more information about this value as, for example, sometimes you display something and you see the same value twice, but they really mean different things internal to the system. So you can just go over there, hover there, and get more information about what specific does that value mean um, in difference to what another value means in our environment. Um, an advancement um, is in the area that we did is in the area of tracking and tracking and fixing build errors. Um, so when you in the past when you were building something and uh, the build process encountered an error, it stopped at that point, um, and you had to go and uh, make corrections to it. Um, with this change here, the behavior is slightly different. The system will actually continue uh, building uh, this environment. And, uh, and gives you a complete list of all the errors that, uh, that the build process encountered um, in your environment. Um, and then you can go there and, um, and make changes to it and apply these kind of changes uh, to the cube without having to rebuild the entire cube. So that's very useful uh, for, for making faster progress of, of getting to the correct result um, that, uh, that you're desiring um, for your environment. So most important aspect of this is without rebuilding uh, the cube. Uh, pivot variables, um, it's uh, that something that um, I wanted to point out that uh, we introduced, you can now use this uh, in all kind of places. Um, um, you define them in the analyzer, um, uh, what, that, what that is, or you can use it in, in rows, in columns, in filters. You can use them um, as in the dashboard. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you uh, you can use them in different places uh, to do so. I encourage you uh, to take a look at this in more detail. It's actually too much to really talk about this in a, in a short session like this. Uh, but uh, this is something we got asked a lot. And, uh, and I'm sure you um, will appreciate this. Um, what's next in 2014.2 uh, is um, Introducing um, aspects for predictive analytics. Um, here we introduce the uh, a language PMP, PML, predictive modeling markup language. Um, you can get information from other third party tools um, and interface with this. And, um, and you can take then these kind of information and actually execute them directly um, inside of the machine. Talk a little bit about uh, Ensemble. Um, uh, feature recap in 2013.1. Uh, major features we introduced the complex record mapper, enterprise message viewer, and HTML, I'm sorry, HL7 custom uh, schema editor. Um, in 2014.1, we have a bunch of uh, new features um, that we introduced. Um, one is the, uh, the, the alert manager. Um, prior to 2014.1, uh, to you had to implement your own alert mechanism um, in your environment. Um, so you had to, um, to route these rules um, to your own mechanism and, uh, and there was no persistent record um, on your system about those. And uh, it was harder to, to deal with these kind of aspects. So now we, uh, we have that as a built-in mechanism in 14.1. Uh, you don't have to do this yourself anymore. Um, you, can, uh, you can view um, your alerts. Uh, you can see what kind of alerts are currently unassigned um, and, uh, and assign them to somebody. Um, and you can then process these. You can open either a new alert or you can open it and close it, um, look into details um, of this alert. One of the biggest problems with a large system is making configuration changes to a, to a live system. Um, a large uh, system uh, could have new interfaces or mo make modifications uh, to a small number of intersystems very frequently, um, maybe um, as frequently as maybe once a week or several times a week. And, um, and those have to be done on a, on a running system. Um, so this is something that uh, we were automating um, and making that easier uh, to apply for your environment. So you can export um, something into a deployment environment 
Um, you start out with uh, just creating an export um, of what you want to apply, uh, copy it then to this target system, and there you deploy this. And during the deployment process, um, the system creates um, like a safe spot so you can roll back um, later on in your environment. Um, stops uh, whatever is there, imports the new classes and, uh, and its settings, uh, and then restarts. And uh, if everything is going well, that is what you have. And if something is encounters an error, it just rolls back to that early state. Um, and, uh, and you're um, at least having something that was running. So you undo uh, the deployment um, of that application, that, uh, that process that you want to do. We introduced um, SOAP um, and REST services. Um, and uh, so you can now um, provide this functionality or consume REST web services uh, with Ensemble uh, that is uh, done through the HTTP adapter. Um, and, uh, and now for business operations, um, you can also use uh, SOAP and REST. Um, uh, as, a, as an option. We're also um, validating um, SAML data uh, for it. That's part of the web services um, standard for the SAML token uh, very, uh, verification, um, which is uh, something that more and more customers are using out there for, for identification purposes, uh, taking the SAML token mechanism of a web service to carry identity information um, across the environment. Um, X12 uh, is something that uh, was developed over three um, versions. So we started with 2013.1, um, introduced a, a new internal format, an XML import and export. In 2014.1, um, we added HIPAA transaction schemas, um, and that is now built in. And in 2014.2, um, we're completing this, uh, this process to support X12. Uh, by supporting to, uh, pure DTL handling of, of interchanges. Um, the HIPAA transactions are, are, uh, are of course, specific to, uh, to the US, um, but, uh, but it is a, is a basic uh, and, and framework-based um, implementation um, that can be adjusted uh, for other message types um, as, as needed. And uh, if you're interested in this, uh, please contact us and see um, how we can help with that. Other features in 2014.1 uh, is uh, semaphore files uh, for um, file and inbound adapters. Um, this is um, as a large mechanism, or it's actually a very common mechanism used uh, to handling um, writing into large files and sharing the knowledge of when actually am I done with this writing to this large file. Uh, so this here is a, is a signaling process um, where we then understand, yes, I'm done writing with this, with this large contents to this file. It's, it's not going to be fast. Um, but then I can pick it up and that avoids um, ensemble picking up a partial file um, and processing it. Um, so it's a very common strategy um, used um, across the country center and, uh, and, uh, and we're providing that mechanism uh, there as well. We did uh, several enhancements to the to the management portal. Um, you can now see the, the, the raw contents of messages, um, the UI for defining the default settings. Um, we uh, did some um, uh, imp uh, improvements for the DTI editor. Um, the layout, uh, it's more consistent, um, performance improvements uh, that have gone in, and, uh, and uh, the activity <coughs> graph um, in production monitor. So what's going to happen in 2014.2? Uh, um, we are completing the rest here as well, so you don't just have to run it to the HTTP adapter. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's going through the, through the full CSP uh, mechanism here as well. Um, and um, so you can use CSP uh, for, 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 for REST as well. So that completes that kind of a project um, for REST and it gives you the flexibility uh, of, of using that technology. Now in 2014.2, um, we're creating um, additional databases to the default databases that, uh, that you have today. Um, and uh, so there is a, there's a specific temp database um, that we're creating for a system 
um, and um, and here goes in based on also on feedback that we got from customers of what they would like to do or what kind of problems they try to solve. Um, this is a non-journaled uh, namespace uh, for temporary data. Um, it is has restrictions on it, um, tighter than actually Cache Temp, and uh, and it's automatically uh, created. Um, when you do an upgrade installation uh, of Ensemble from the previous version. It's in general something that, uh, that we're using across products um, to use more databases for certain kind of functionality. Uh, for example, in Cache, uh, I don't know if you have noticed this, but we're starting to offer now um, two databases. Uh, if you create a new uh, namespace where we want you to preferable go the path of splitting routines and data into two different databases and instead of using them in one, uh, which will help uh, you in the future to have easier ways of deploying your application um, if you make that split. Um, another second database here from Ensemble that we did is for more for security uh, purposes. Um, and uh, that goes and takes all kind of security data that goes into the environment. Um, you know that Ensemble um, has to store information that is sensitive um, in an environment. For example, if you have an ensemble system that has to connect to another system, which requires authentication, because this is a, is a process, um, a device basically that connects to the other system, it needs to have the username and password uh, to present to the other system. Uh, the only way to really handle it is to do this in clear text. Um, so it has to store the username and password in, in, in ensemble do this kind of authentication. Um, so now you can actually move this into a database separately from the, from the system um, and, and can apply security settings to it to so basically create a secure container for it. Uh, you can apply encryption for it so the file is, uh, is not visible uh, to the outside uh, in your environment. Um, so that's a, that's a big security feature that helps you uh, to make better on the deployment scenarios um, as far as security is concerned. Other features um, that are um, going into the product is um, support for repeating fields and delimited record maps on the new queues page, um, better querying debugging um, mechanism um, for message, message searches. Um, the, uh, the rules editor uh, has seen a bunch of improvements um, to make the, the display here as well. Um, and, uh, and one of the, the biggest changes that, that have gone in is an is a enterprise uh, monitor for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the ensemble product in itself uh, that underwent um, a, lot, a big rewrite uh, for the ensemble specific components. Um, there are other um, efforts underway um, to consolidate monitoring um, inside across all products that we have, um, and, uh, and and unify them. Um, so this is this is helping us uh, as far as ensemble is concerned. Going to the step where there's also substantial improvements coming into the cache world um, as far as uh, monitoring of, of your system is concerned, um, and then also create something that gives you a a single point of, of looking at the state of my environment. Um, so you get a consolidated view and you can see here are my 1500 instances running in my environment, which of these are operate within um, assumed correct health parameters, which should I be concerned about, or which already are in a, in a state where I defined that this is an unhealthy system, this is a system that is concerned about performing uh, to standards. Uh, we want to make it easier um, to use the um, the enterprise uh, service enter use enter use ensemble as the enterprise service bus. There's another area that, um, that uh, gets a lot of attention into systems. Uh, the enterprise service bus in itself is a, is an implementation. Uh, we're looking here also for performance improvements, um, trying to get more scalability out of out of this specific aspect uh, of the product, get more throughput, more messages through the system. Um, this is a very complex system, so you have to decide at some point uh, where you want to do go. Do I want to give up certain kind of things that are really not required um, in, in some environments, um, like persisting things 
and rather go for throughput, for example. And, uh, and then a big request is uh, running ensemble in the cloud. Um, this, is, uh, this is part of, uh, of a lot of different, um, again, cross products, um, um, efforts that we're currently undertaking where um, we try to build um, an environment and a strategy of how to address the cloud. How do I uh, get an ensemble or a cache system installed on the cloud? How do I provision um, the ensemble or cache instance on the cloud? For example, how do I get my 10,000 users now defined on this cloud? How do I get my security settings um, on this cloud? This is, um, this is an important thing. So the next thing is how do I get my application um, settings up into the cloud? Um, my application as itself is code and data, uh, the settings of my applications, and then the other part is uh, interfacing with the cloud management aspect in itself. Um, how, how do I currently define what do I need? How much performance do I need? How much disk capacity do I need? How much CPU <coughs> capacity do I need at this time? And being also able to uh, react to uh, flexibly, being, flex uh, being flexible to demands. Um, so that system is not heavily used right now. I reduce the size of the virtual machine. If I need more heavy uh, performance out of it, I increase the number of CPUs on the cores that I have and get more throughput on it. And, um, and that has to work maybe on a schedule or in an instance <coughs> decision that somebody is making. So that's something that, that we're heading towards. Um, so if you have uh, interest in, in moving to the cloud and, uh, and want to learn more about uh, what our thoughts are about, a bit about this are, the roadmaps that we have about this, um, or in general provide uh, feedbacks or concerns or wishes on this topic, I very much would like to, uh, to speak with you about this and hear um, your thoughts on this, uh, on this topic. Um, at uh, the end, I would like to talk about um, something that we released this year uh, for the first time. Um, I've talked about the Enterprise Miniature a lot in the past and always said eventually we will have it. Uh, this year we finally released it. Uh, it's 2014.1. And the Enterprise Manager is a, is a centralized application um, that you get from InterSystems. Um, it's managing and it sees all kind of instances that you have in your environment and manage them all from a centralized location. So if you remember some of the things I just said about cloud strategy or monitoring, consolidating your view, um, you can see that uh, the natural host for these kind of functionalities are all in the Enterprise Manager. Enterprise Manager has a secure trust communication relationship with each instance. So we now can do things that are either very hard to do today or impossible to do if you follow standard procedures. For example, updating a security certificate before it expires. I can now do this automatically with the Enterprise Manager. Uh, not in that version, but uh, in 2014 it will, it will be part. So Enterprise Manager 2014.1, it has instances have to be registered. Um, they're then assigned to groups at the core functionality of the Enterprise Manager. Everything that gets the same setting um, um, it goes into a, into a group um, and then they get the, all the same uh, settings for a given service. Um, Enterprise Manager itself then has services um, and, uh, and there are a number of services uh, that we're providing today and there will be more in the future. It's a free application. You can just download it from the InterSystems FTP server. Um, so it's a, it has a built-in mechanism. You can only use it as an enterprise manager, so there are some restrictions on it. It's not just a, a cache instance. Um, it's a full built application, and for security reasons, we can only allow you to use it as an enterprise manager. You can't do anything else with this, uh, with this instance. And it manages 2014.1 or later. So what kind of services do we have? We have a configuration service, basically everything in your CPF file with the exception of mirroring, and we're ignoring right now hardware-specific parameters like buffer memory. Um, this, is, this is more complex to do and requires more underlying system work before we can fully support this which are happening as well. So we will have in the future, we have a security service. Uh, so that basically your resources and roles, user service, um, defines the user record, uh, what is the name of the user, um, what kind of roles does the user have um, in my environment, um, 
If you want to mon be managed for this, you have to be, of course, managed for security services as well, because otherwise we wouldn't know what kind of votes you can, you can assign to this user. And then we have a license server um, or a license service, um, and that license service helps you to set up um, license server configuration. So where multiple instances share the same license um, and share maybe capacity about this. In 2014.2, we're introducing a new namespace service um, that gives more granularity. Um, we're extracting additional things from the configuration service, uh, making this there is its own service. It's all related, things related to um, databases, namespaces, and everything related to connectivity, like ECP configuration, shadow configurations. Uh, this all goes into one. Um, the idea behind this is that at some point, we can actually understand what your network is look, what looks like. So we know which systems are connected to each other um, and can make this, uh, um, decisions about this either automatically or you, we can prevent things going wrong because we know what kind of connections you have and what the type of these connections are in your environment. Um, we have a master group mechanism that basically, in simple form, you can think of this as a template uh, makes it easier import export capabilities and uh, it will support of course multiple versions so you can then support 2014.1 and 2014.2 but with 14.1 because we only had one version we didn't have to implement this feature um, so with 2014.1 where we implement this we also went one version back so 2014.1 of the enterprise manager can also manage 2013.1 so we're going one back version older uh, than the previous one, which can only manage 2014.1. Then we have variable name substitution, again, that helps you to have uh, centralized groups and template mechanisms. For example, um, you have a home directory for the path of your databases. So you can specify this up here as a template with a variable name. And as you go down, you resolve this name to something specific to your environment. For example, your test environment always has a certain task name. Your production name has a certain task name. So instead of managing them uh, separately, you can manage them as a unit, and it gets resolved um, further down on, on how the system works. So there's a lot of additional work that goes into the enterprise manager in itself. Um, for example, we do certificate management uh, there. That's a project underway um, because the enterprise manager itself is certificate-based once you lose that certificate on the other side, you cannot communicate with it anymore. So it will auto-renew its own certificates, um, but it, that's a feature available um, to you as well, much easier certificate. And then it, this monitoring, so we get the centralized view of, of, of the monitoring uh, in the Enterprise Manager, and you see like a state there. Uh, it's like a traffic light state, is the, is the instance either red, green, or yellow that you can go from there and drill down and uh, discover what kind of options do I take, what kind of actions do I take based on the discovery that the system has. Um, that's uh, all I, what I wanted to talk about uh, today. Um, I could have put more slides in, but uh, they're all following the Stefan's area, so I'm, I'm leaving that to Stefan. Any questions? If you have any questions, I'm around all day. Uh, Please find me again if you want to hear something about cloud or want to talk about it. I very much would like to talk to you about it. Thank you very much.